Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 295th episode, we have a bunch of news, including an ankylosaur with gut contents Ooh. and a new sauropodomorph. Even better. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Dinosaur of the Day, Cryptosaurus. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank 10 of our patrons who were the lucky drawing winners this week. And they are Mello Stego, Diplodocate, Jackson Crawford, Richard, Stego Sophie, Ray, Vikram and Karthik, Daniel McGill, Greg, and John Heck. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. We really appreciate all of your support. And if you want to get in on this, not just having your name called out, but also requesting dinosaurs and watching movies with us and chatting on Discord while we do it every week, then check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino. Jumping into the news, up first we have the ankylosaur paper, because ankylosaurs always come before sauropods. No, they don't. (laughs) Even when the sauropods are new dinosaurs. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know about this method. This paper is fantastic, and it is gut contents, which is another one of your favorites. Yeah, but compared to sauropod, I don't know. It's a sauropod morph. It's not even a real sauropod. Mm, Just get on with it. (laughs) Okay. So this article was written by Kayla Brown and others, and that's a clue at what it is. It was published in the Royal Society Open Science, which is open access, and it's really well written. We talked to Kayla Brown years ago at this point when shortly after he described Borealopelta. Oh, yeah. There are good gut contents. There are, but they hadn't been formally described or really described in any way that I had seen before this paper came out. So... I really like this article because in it, they define most of the botany terms for us dinosaur people. So it's not too hard to follow along with, but I had to go down a bunch of rabbit holes anyway, just because (laughs) it's very interesting. But what it's all about is that Borealopelta gut contents. You're probably familiar with Borealopelta. It's that amazing ankylosaur at the Royal Tyrrell Museum in Alberta, Canada, It looks almost mummified. It has its eyelids. It has keratin on its armor on its back and obviously gut contents as well. It's pretty much articulated. It looks just like something got buried and preserved exactly like it was stuck in carbonite Star Wars style. And then they've discovered it 100 million years later. It's one of the coolest finds I've ever seen. But this paper is all about the cololite or colon rock. (laughs) in the dinosaur i hadn't heard of cololite before we usually talk about coprolite which is the poop fossilized this is the fossilized anything in the gi tract it doesn't have to be specifically in the colon Hmm. good to know yeah and in this case they think it was probably in the stomach or in the gizzard more on that later but interestingly the stomach position of Borealopelta, where they ended up sectioning off little samples to test what was in the gut contents, it's in the same position that Kumbarasaurus, that Australian ankylosaur, had its gut contents. And apparently, it's pretty much where our stomach is, sort of like if we're on all fours and you pointed to your stomach, that is essentially where (laughs) the stomach is in this ankylosaurus, maybe a little bit farther down because our stomach is actually kind of up by our heart. Most people think of their stomachs, they're actually pointing to their intestines. Your stomach isn't really by your belly button. That's intestines, a little higher up and on the left side. And apparently that left-sided shift is the same in almost all vertebrates. So including fish, humans, dinosaurs, we all have our stomach kind of in our torso on the left side. It's pretty interesting. It is interesting. That's one of those things where it's like, Something you wouldn't predict being the same in everything by evolution, but I guess there's no reason for it to shift around all the time. Yeah. (laughs) The authors point out that, quote, mega herbivores, in other words, over a metric ton, have disproportionate effects on the landscapes they occupy and are termed keystone herbivores, end quote. So what exactly Borealopelta ate is obviously very important because it had a pretty big impact on the environment. Although... Borealopelta is estimated at 1,300 kilograms or 2,900 pounds, which is even smaller than a lot of today's mammalian mega herbivores, which all mega herbivores apparently are now mammals. (laughs) There are no more mega herbivorous dinosaurs. Even ostriches are a little too light to make the cut. Oh, true. 
but it made me imagine like sauropods at tens of thousands of kilograms, just how much they would have impacted the environment, would have made this Borealopelta impact seem small by comparison, I'm sure. Mm Mm-hmm. So, like I said, in order to figure out the gut contents and what it contained, they took thin slices of the gut contents and then threw it under a microscope. That's the process known as histology that we talk about a lot. It's destructive, so it's not always popular to do because once you cut it, you can't uncut it, but you can learn so much from doing this kind of sampling. If you read a report about it, you probably got the wrong idea about what was in its gut contents. Everything I saw said that it was 88% plant material. It's definitely not 88% plant material. It was 55% rock in the form of gastroliths. So most of what was in there was rocks for grinding up the food. That's a lot of gastroliths. It is. It was 25% matrix, which is basically fill rock that came in during the fossilization process, 7% empty space, and just 13% actual plant food in the mix. That seems like a very inefficient digestive system. (laughs) Well, it's possible there. I mean, we don't know exactly what it was like when it was alive. So it's possible that maybe that material digested a little bit more after it had died because it's sitting in stomach acid, presumably. Mm. So maybe that empty space, maybe it was like 20 percent before or maybe the matrix squished it down. So it was taking up more space. It's hard to say. Do you think the rocks in its stomach helped it sink to the bottom of the water? Maybe, although usually when they depict the bloat and float thing, they have it upside down with Mm. a stomach up. So I guess relative to that huge armor shield on its back. The The rocks were nothing. Yeah, probably not too much. (laughs) But it might have helped. I don't know. They didn't find any animal parts in there. I was kind of hoping there'd be just like a little piece of a mammal or like a little tooth or something to show that this ankylosaur was munching on a slow (laughs) mammal or some other animal. But... I can't think of an animal that's much slower than an ankylosaur. They're not, you have to be quick to hunt even something that's injured. And I don't think ankylosaurs were really up to the task. Maybe they could have scavenged though. Who knows? Of the plant material, that 13% of the stomach, which is actually something maybe it could have digested, 88% of it is basically leaves. They call it leaves, but it's really like 85% ferns and about 3% cycads. And then some traces of conifers, which are things like pine trees and redwood, and maybe a tiny bit of angiosperms in the mix. So it's mostly eating ferns. I guess ferns have leaves, but it's not usually what I think of when I think of leaves. It's a different sort of thing. Most of that, too, was in sort of a mashed up, partially digested sort of look to it. It wasn't like these nice you know, fern pressings where you could look at it and see it in all this detail. It's kind of mashed up and not super easy to identify. The other 12% of the plant material, because I said 88% of his leaves, contained 3% stems, 4% other wood, and 6% charcoal. Other wood? Yeah, so, you know, when you're eating and you don't have hands, (laughs) you might accidentally pick up some, you know, like bark, Or larger things that are a little bit bigger than a stem. Yeah, it happens. And they've got the gastroliths in a pretty hearty digestive tract. So I guess they're not sweating 4% of their food being (laughs) just wood. Although if I was served something and 7% of it was inedible wood, I wouldn't be super excited about it. Or maybe 12% if you include the charcoal. That's a big percentage when you consider only 13% was vegetation. Yeah, that's true. Which makes it only like 11 or 12 percent that's actually digestible. But the charcoal is really interesting because it might indicate that Borealopelta was munching on ferns in a recently burned down conifer forest. Mm. Which gives you a good stage to think about what it might have looked like in its final days. Or it knew about the benefits of activated charcoal. (laughs) Yeah, that's, that's possible. Some animals do intentionally eat charcoal, so it could be doing that. Sort of like the hadrosaur that seemed to be eating wood to get at those crustaceans in it Mm -hmm. to get the calcium. It could be the same kind of weird thing that we don't know about. Or it likes the smoky flavor. I don't know. Yeah. But in order for there to be that much charcoal around, it did have to be somewhere that there was a fire, at least semi-recently, I would say. In order to really carefully determine whether what they were looking at was gut contents versus just other plant material that happened to fossilize about where a stomach would be. 
they really carefully compared the gut contents or the presumed gut contents to the surrounding matrix that wasn't in the gut contents spot. It's really important with herbivores because there's a huge opportunity for contamination. Basically, what we're mostly looking at is stuff like pollen that fossilizes relatively easily. And you can easily imagine that when it died, if it's opened up, any kind of pollen could easily just get inside its body. And then if you're looking inside it, you'd say, oh, well, this is inside. It must be something it ate. But really, during fossilization, most of the stuff that ends up where its guts would be is just surrounding matrix, right? It's just stuff that's in the environment. So it's a really important thing to look into. One of the keys to this is looking at differences between what's inside and outside, because presumably animals don't eat everything equally. We tend to assume that they have a little bit of a selection going on. They're not just shoveling everything into their mouth. They probably prefer one food or another. So if there's more of one type of food inside and it's a different distribution than what's outside, that's a good clue. But one of the problems with that can be if you imagine, say, you've got a dinosaur and it's kind of opened up on the gut side because it's dead and things are snacking on it or it's decaying. If there's some sort of flow of material, it could potentially select for different types of materials, like say smaller things might collect inside the abdomen, whereas larger things might wash by if say water is running by and it's kind of moving material by. So that alone isn't really good enough. You want to look for a lot of other factors. They came up with like 14 different factors in what might tell you that it was gut contents versus just surrounding material. And they went through and they ranked every other herbivorous dinosaur that has preserved gut contents, which really wasn't that many. There were only like eight of them that I guess were good enough to make their list. One example is a sauropod, and in its quote-unquote gut contents, it included an allosaurus tooth and a bunch of other bone fragments. Oh, and maybe it was <laughs> using that as a makeshift gastrolyph. Maybe, but it seems a lot more likely that this wasn't actually its gut contents and it was just material that was sort of washed in. Yeah. And that's basically what everyone has said since that paper was published. Like, this probably isn't really got gut contents. Come on, guys. Just because it was inside the abdomen doesn't mean that it's gut contents. There's also an advantage you can find where some things preserve better inside versus outside the guts. Like I was talking about with how a lot of the material that seems to be gut contents was sort of mashed up. That's the kind of thing you'd expect to see in gut contents, whereas you wouldn't expect to see that sort of mashed mess outside. You'd expect to see more intact structures potentially. And then there are other things like spores that are just even, like apparently they're super durable. So you can find them inside, outside, all over the place. So after they went through all of these traits and went through all of the other herbivorous dinosaurs, they threw out almost all of the other dinosaurs and said, like, that probably isn't gut contents or there isn't a lot of support for it, except they had one other really good case. And other than Borealopelta, the only other dinosaur they considered well-supported in terms of its gut contents was Kumbarasaurus. And Kumbarasaurus is that much smaller Australian ankylosaur. We saw it at the Queensland Museum just about nine months ago now, I think. It's the one that they compared to to figure out what part of the stomach they were looking at. Yeah, it was like right in that exact same spot as Kumbarasaurus. And interestingly, though, in Kumbarasaurus, it is much smaller, but they didn't find any gastroliths in it, which makes me think maybe Kumbarasaurus, they were sampling the stomach versus Borealopelta, they were sampling the gizzard which would help to explain why Kumbarasaurus doesn't have any gastroliths, whereas Borealopelta was mostly <laughs> gastroliths, since we do think that a lot of dinosaurs had gizzards, especially with ankylosaurs because they didn't really have good teeth for chewing. So if they're just kind of swallowing stuff whole, it'd be nice if it could go into a gizzard, get ground up by those gizzard stones, and then move on to the stomach for a little bit more chemical treatment, or maybe go back and forth a bunch like happens in some birds. Similar to Borealopelta, though, I went back and reread the Kumbarasaurus paper just to be thorough. In Kumbarasaurus, about 10% of its gut contents, they think, was plant material, which is pretty similar to the 13% that we see in Borealopelta. Mm -hmm. And in Kumbarasaurus, again, they said it was mostly vascular tissue, which is probably stuff like ground up leaves or otherwise kind of smashed up leaves. So in addition to both of them having a lot of features that make them look individually like they're probably gut contents, they also align with each other. So the pair of them sort of support that 
you know, it's probably gut contents because otherwise you'd have to have the same coincidence of things being shoved into the abdomen after they died and fossilizing just so. Yeah, true. <laughs> Do you not like this description of things getting shoved into abdomens? Eh, not so much, no. <laughs> so when they were comparing what was inside versus outside of Borealopelta, they identified 50 different palynomorphs, I think is how you say it. And what a palynomorph is, is a tough fossil that's microscopic. The maximum size is half a millimeter in the larger dimension. Wow. So yeah, these are really small things. In this case, it's pretty much pollen and spores, but they're super useful. They're really useful in general in paleontology, just like those little micro fossils of aquatic animals that seem to evolve quickly. And then you can use them to sort of date things because there's a lot of evolution happening and they preserve well. Mm -hmm. Same kind of things with these microfossils. Of the 50, they could only identify 42 of them to a specific taxa. That's pretty good. I, yeah, I was pretty impressed. And I think one of them got named based on this finding at one point as well. 28 of them are ferns and things that are pretty similar looking called club mosses. Many of those were found inside Borealopelta's gut. So again, these of these 50, this is 50 that were both inside and outside of Borealopelta because when you don't selectively eat pollen and spores, really. So you'd expect to see a lot of it distributed everywhere. It's more of just an idea about what's in the environment. There were 12 conifers, and again, that's things like pines and redwood trees, Despite there being less than half as many types of pollen of conifers versus ferns, they made up most of the external sample in terms of the quantity. So the fact that there were only traces of conifer plant material inside Borealopelta's gut versus there being a large amount of it outside the gut helps to show that it wasn't just things getting washed in because we would have expected to see way more conifer inside Borealopelta if that was the case. And then last but not least, there were two, maybe three angiosperms, which are plants with flowers and or fruit. There wasn't really any in the gut contents. There's maybe a little trace of it based on some unidentified leaves. But this is early Albion, which is about 110 million years ago. So we don't think angiosperms were really widely distributed at that point. So it's not too surprising that there weren't many angiosperms. The paper includes some really cool pictures they're not like leaf pressings. <laughs> like I said, the leaves are in cross section if they're identifiable at all. So you can kind of see a little bit of that spongy leaf tissue, at least when it's under a microscope. But most of the spores and other tiny stuff looks pretty cool. It's hard for me to make any sense of it, but it's got all sorts of different spikes and patterns and things. So people that know what they're looking at <laughs> can identify this and say, oh, that's this type of fern or club moss or whatever. There is one really cool twig with growth rings, though, that's a couple of millimeters wide. So you can actually see, even though it's only a couple millimeters across, it's at least two years old. Hmm. So that's a one slow growing twig. <laughs> and under a microscope, the twig looks enormous because these are little tiny sections they're looking at trying to find details of pollen inside it. I also feel like I should mention, previously, it's been reported that there's a potentially piscivorous meaning fish-eating ankylosaur in China. And so I was kind of hoping to see some fish bones or something in this guy. But it looks like it was in a forest, so maybe it just wasn't near fish. We don't know if it's this individual specifically went after ferns and these types of foods, or if it just happened to be going after an opportunity that came up. And the same for the ankylosaur in China, that it just goes after whatever opportunity strikes and... That's what this individual came across, because really we're just looking at a snapshot of time in one individual. We're not looking at all Borealopelta and not even all of this Borealopelta's diet over the course of a year. So it's really hard to draw any conclusions outside of just this is what it was eating that day. Yes. And just want to mention, could be a guy or a gal. We don't know the gender. True. Yeah. I always think of it as male because the species name is Mark Mitchelli <laughs> after the preparator, kind of like Sue the T-Rex. I always think of it as fe female because it's named after Sue Henderson who found it. But really, yeah, that's not true. <laughs> Good point. One really cool thing about this paper, though, is I think it's a great opportunity for paleo art. Unfortunately, there wasn't any included with the paper, but we know so much about it now. We know it was snacking on ferns in a recently burnt conifer forest. Again, 6% of its gut contents had burnt wood versus only 4% for non-burnt wood. So even if it was trying to eat burnt wood, 
There was a lot of burnt wood. Yeah, there was a lot available. <laughs> and we also know that ferns often pop up first after a fire. So when a forest burns down, ferns are kind of a disaster tax. Uh, you can think of them. They're really good at just springing up on little to no notice <laughs> and taking over the place at least briefly before other trees and stuff can regrow. And in this case, it looks like Borealopelta was ready and waiting. And once all those ferns popped up, it was go time and got in there and started snacking away. And apparently moose and other herbivores do this today. When forests burn down and ferns pop up, they get in there and eat a whole bunch of ferns. Mm. It's pretty interesting. Maybe making Borealopelta like the moose of the Cretaceous. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know it probably led to its downfall, though, considering it died shortly after. Yeah. I was thinking, too, like you could imagine the scenario where it was recently burned down, possibly making it more susceptible to flooding because you don't you might not have all the roots and the the strength of those trees and plants holding the soil together. So then if there's a strong rain afterwards, it could be more susceptible to flooding. And, oh, and then it gets washed away and turned upside down and the rest is history. Exactly. It also made me wonder, like, I wonder if that charcoal and other stuff in the sediment might have led to that especially thick concretion that it was found in that preserved it so well. Mm, maybe. I don't know. They didn't say anything about this. I'm just <laughs> randomly speculating. <laughs> but one thing that they did say that there is scientific support for is what time of year it died. So apparently they think there's good evidence that it died in the late spring to midsummer which is a pretty specific time range. That is. This is based partly on the lags in that twig that it ate because you can tell essentially how far through the season it was because in the winter is when the lag forms. So if you can kind of measure from the most recent lag and see how frequently they're growing, you can kind of estimate what time of year it was. And on top of that, there are different types of pollen that are in its guts and in the surrounding matrix. It helped to identify those 42 yeah, exactly. Because if you know that there's a certain type of plant which tends to release all its pollen in that late spring, midsummer time frame, and there's a whole bunch of that pollen present, then that's a good indicator. Good old gut contents. They're pretty good. They are. But they're very tricky to identify when it comes to herbivores. I think it's a lot easier when it comes to carnivores because you're unlikely to find like a mass of ground up bone and stuff just <laughs> laying around. Maybe it's easier to identify that as if you find that in an animal, it's probably something it ate. Right. Although I wonder if you find a whole animal in a carnivorous gut content, if you could take that at face value now. Yeah. Well, we, we did talk about that small bird-like, I think it was an antiornithine from the J-hole biota or something that seemed like it swallowed a lizard hole face first. Mm. Do you remember that one? Mm -hmm. And then it died after the fact and it, it's kind of like inside what looks like it would have been where its esophagus was. Seems like a pretty good explanation. Yes, although I recently saw a video of a seagull swallowing a rat hole. So, Yeah, the seagull swallowing the rat hole is... An insane video. Yes. <laughs> it shows that opportunistic nature of seagulls and why they will eventually re-inherit the earth. Or just the capabilities of dinosaurs in general. Yeah, still going after mammals. Our next article is also in an open access journal. This one's in Scientific Reports, and it was written by Claire Pere de Fabregue and others. And in it, they describe a new non-sauropodin sauropodomorph. And what does that mean? <laughs> well, usually it means that it has arm-like front limbs, which is true in this case as well. So it's not a big sauropod, not like Diplodocus kind of thing where it's all elephant-y, four legs on the ground, massive weight, needs all limbs possible in use to hold itself up. Columnar legs. This one looks more like a traditional early dinosaur, you know, bipedal, long, short, I mean long, <laughs> front to back, short, <laughs> going up. <laughs> <laughs> that makes more sense. Yeah. It's named Irisosaurus yemenensis, and Irisosaurus is after the, quote, famous iridescent clouds of Yunnan province, end quote. And Holtz pointed out that the name should be Iridosaurus because it's iridescent, and that's how you Latinize it, not mm. 
Irisosaurus or Eurisosaurus, whatever they're going for. I'm just going to call it a Ritosaurus because I trust Holtz that that's the correct way to call it. And then Yemenensis is after Yemen County, where it was found. You might be able to tell based on this name that it's from China. It's from the Feng Jiahe Formation, which is just a bit southwest of the Lufeng Formation. So if you know Lufungosaurus, that's another sauropodomorph. It's very common. They're everywhere. They are. <laughs> it's also a similar age to Lufungosaurus. It's about 195 million years old, putting it in the very early Jurassic. It's a time period we don't have very well preserved in North America, but it's pretty good down there in southern China. Of Iridosaurus, they found a pretty good part of the maybe front third of the animal. Basically, they got both arms in good detail with most of the bones all the way between the fingertips up through the shoulders. So good front arms. The rest of it is not nearly as good. <laughs> they did find several neck vertebrae, a couple of back vertebrae. They said over 50 rib fragments, but they didn't show much of that. And I don't know how big these fragments are, so I'm not sure how many ribs that accounts to because you could have one rib broken into 50 pieces Ooh. and that'd be 50 rib fragments. <laughs> but ribs aren't all that useful anyway for figuring out what an animal is like. On the other hand, they did find two pieces of the hip, which is more useful, a partial toe bone, and some of the upper and lower jaws, including a tooth. Nice. It's always good to get part of the skull when you can. It's about 5 meters or 16 feet long if you recreated its entire body length. Obviously, those fossils alone are only maybe a meter long. But there's no mention of lags or any other age markers that I could find in the paper. So you have to take that size with a grain of salt because who knows, maybe it was three years old and it would have gotten five times that big. We just they didn't say. But it is pretty small, even for an early sauropodomorph. It's sort of that typical, like I said, long length <laughs> head to tail direction, bipedal stance. Its neck isn't particularly long, so it couldn't have gotten its head up that much. Just kind of looks like a sauropodomorph, generically speaking. <laughs> <laughs> the hands, as you'd expect, don't look like they would have been very good feet because... They weren't feet yet. Exactly. But they do look like maybe they could pronate a little bit because they had a lot of details from the arms and the wrists. So it looks like maybe they could have rotated a little bit. And pronating again is like if you're doing push-ups... You have to put your hands in a pronated position, whereas if you're clapping, that's not pronated. And we talk about how dinosaurs like Velociraptor probably couldn't pronate, so they would have had their arms in the clappy slash flapping, <laughs> if you're a bird, sort of dimension. But sauropodomorphs, for the most part, we can tell from their footprints, pronated their hands quite a bit, as most quadrupedal animals like to get the toes in front is nice. So this one maybe was able to do a little bit of that pronation. The arms look like they reached maybe about halfway to the ground in its standing posture. So again, yeah, probably not using its front limbs as feet unless it wanted to really angle downward awkwardly. I mean, I guess we don't have its hind legs, so maybe they could have been really short and completely different than every other early dinosaur we found, but it seems pretty unlikely, so we're going with bipedal. The hands, though, it's interesting, when you look at them closely, you can see a lot of similarities to the front feet of the later huge sauropods. They've got the really short individual fingers, and they've got pretty long claws, just like you see on some of the later sauropods that we think would have been good at, like, scratching the ground and stuff. It's really interesting how you can see these connections. And they don't look like they would have been very good at grasping anything to speak of, so this wasn't, like, carnivorous by any stretch, because it's, it's not grabbing anything with these short stocky fingers <laughs> what was the point might as well turn them into feet yeah exactly interestingly the one tooth that they have doesn't have any denticles or serrations on it and most other sauropodomorphs from that time do so it's kind of a weird tooth there's one other relative it has from the area though that also doesn't have denticles so it's not super weird it looks superficially to me kind of like a camarasaurus chisel type tooth if you're familiar with the type of teeth that Camarasaurus has, it's not like a Diplodocus tooth, which is real thin and peg-like, sort of like a pencil. It's significantly wider. I think they said the length to width ratio is something like two and a half. So it's pretty beefy tooth in there. They couldn't have fit that many in their jaw. 
When they did their phylogenetics, it came out as a relative to Musaurus, and Musaurus was about 20 million years earlier, well back into the Triassic and in Argentina. So it's a little bit weird because this one's way over in China and it's less closely related to the Chinese dinosaurs. But back in the early Jurassic, late Triassic, it was a lot closer getting between China <laughs> and South America than it is now. You could pretty much walk all the way there. So I guess it's not too surprising that they're close relatives. And Eridosaurus, in its phylogenetics, is just outside of sauropodiforms. If you're familiar with that group, it's sort of halfway in between the earliest sauropodomorphs and real sauropoda. We never really talk about sauropodiformes because we just say sauropodomorph. That just includes all of the early stuff. We don't have to worry about it then if it gets reclassified later. But yeah, so this is sort of in the middle. It's considered pretty basal, though, if it's outside of sauropodiformes. One kind of cool thing about its hands, it had a pretty big claw and it was curved on its first finger. So they said that maybe it was for grasping. I don't know how much I buy that because the finger bones leading up to that claw really don't look like they could bend very much. But maybe it was enough to be able to grasp onto like a tree. Could hook onto a branch or something. Yeah, that kind of thing. It's not. I don't think it's going to be able to grasp as in like picking up anything. And to that end, it had some included paleo art, which shows it sort of using its hands to help it prop itself up on a tree so that it can reach its head up higher because it didn't have the great neck of later sauropods. So maybe it used its hands to sort of work its way up the tree a little bit so it could reach some of those tasty tree leaves. Tree stars? Maybe. I mean, almost certainly not, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> One can imagine. Yeah. You got another sauropodomorph now, though. Nice. In other dinosaur news, we heard about some reopenings for museums. So the Field Museum in Chicago is reopening on July 24th, and they're taking a lot of precautions. So the number of visitors allowed will be 25% of their building's capacity. Visitors will have entry times to go into the museum, and everyone over the age of two must wear a mask. Wow. Yes, there will also be hand sanitizers around the building and floor markers to help with social distancing, and they promise to do frequent cleanings of the museum following CDC guidelines. Oh, and interactive exhibits and exhibits in small spaces are still closed. It's interesting with the masks. I can't imagine trying to put a mask on a three-year-old. That would not be an easy task. If you bribe them with dinosaurs, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I wonder if they let in children under two at all. Oh, I didn't see on their guidelines. Yeah. Might have to call and ask. I'd be pretty nervous even going in if it was 25% capacity. It's a lot of people. Yeah, they were looking based on the size of their building. Yeah, that's good. Those dinosaur halls are still going to be crowded, though. You know it. Well, that's partly why there's specific entry times that you can go in. Mm, makes sense. In London, the Natural History Museum is reopening on August 5th. Visitors are going to have to buy tickets in advance. You'll also be admitted based on the time of your ticket. And everyone over the age of 11 there must wear a mask. There's going to be hand sanitizer stations and then signs for social distancing. And they will also be cleaning facilities regularly. Oh, and some hands-on exhibits and digital touch screens will be closed. Makes sense. And then last, that we heard about recently anyway, the Royal Saskatchewan Museum has already reopened. Some things, though, like the Paleo Pit is closed. A maximum of 75 people can enter that museum at any given time. And when you visit, you'll need to provide your contact information in case the museum needs to work with the health authority on any contact tracing. Hmm. And all visitors over the age of three must wear a mask. They'll also have hand sanitizers available around the museum. And visitors will have to stay two meters away from others and follow marked routes through the galleries for social distancing. It's really interesting where they're drawing the line. You've got two-year-olds and above, three-year-olds and above, and 11-year-olds and above I have to wear a mask. Well, it's three different countries. Yeah. I guess maybe things are a little bit more calmed down in the UK, so they feel like they can notch it up to 11-year-olds and up. Maybe, yeah. I'm not clear on the reasoning behind all of it. I'm glad that they're enforcing masks, though, because it is the number one way to stop the spread of coronavirus. So mm -hmm. good on them. I definitely will not be going to a dinosaur museum anytime soon, though. I'm scared even just thinking about it. Like thinking there's 75 people in there with you and you have to sign up just in case you might have caught it. Like, yeah. I think if I actually psyched myself up enough to get there and then they said sign this 
in case somebody in here has coronavirus and we need to tell you about it, I'd be like, okay, I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think any museums near us are reopening. No, no. California is not ready. So Chicago's just a little out of reach for us right now. <laughs> it's true. Oh, in New Jersey, Field Station Dinosaurs is teaching kids about social distancing and wearing masks. And part of it is they put masks on all their dinosaurs. That's a pretty good one because that one's fully outdoors. Mm -hmm. feel maybe okay with that. Still probably not. But stay maybe. six feet away. And, yeah. yeah. It's hard when you get excited about dinosaurs to stay six feet away. <laughs> <laughs> in other news, on August 6th in Langley, British Columbia in Canada, there's going to be an animatronic dinosaur and fossil auction. And that will include more than 50 animatronic dinosaurs and other animatronic equipment, as well as hundreds of fossils. And the dinosaurs include T-Rex, Brontosaurus, Triceratops, Velociraptor, Aranosaurus, Kentrosaurus, Dilophosaurus, and Amargosaurus. And on the fossil side... Ooh, Amargosaurus would be a good one. Yes. And on the fossil side, there will be fossilized eggs, trilobites, and leaves. And this whole auction came about because a Canadian subsidiary of a firm went bankrupt. I'm not sure which firm. So that's who you have to thank if you end up buying one of these. <laughs> <laughs> or not think if you liked going there before. <laughs> right. People can see all the items on display on August 5th as long as you're wearing masks in person. There's going to be no minimum bids and the auction will take place online only starting at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. Whatever you buy, though, you will need to transport yourself. So think about that when you're bidding. <laughs> According to Aldergrove Star, which wrote about this, Quote, the designs appear similar to those created by a Chinese company called Gungu Longtun Science and Technology, end quote. And that's one of the largest of more than two dozen companies in Sichuan, China, that makes dinosaur replicas. So you could compare the price of a new one and have your starting point for what you'd pay for a used one, I guess. Or you go much lower and see what you can get away with. That's true. Yeah, one of our listeners, I think, mentioned this to us. And if we needed any. And I was thinking, well, maybe for our front yard, we could, we we have, could stick something out there. We don't have the space. Yeah, we don't. Not for an Amargosaurus, at least. <laughs> Not for any of them. <laughs> we, could, we could fit a Dilophosaurus out there. Uh, maybe. For sure. How would we even get it here? That's the problem. Yeah. That would probably cost more than whatever we end up bidding. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> in media news, the Hulu platform, which unfortunately I think you can only watch in the U.S., but they have a new movie called Palm Springs. This was <laughs> trending on Twitter a little bit. It's a time loop romantic comedy. It stars Andy Samberg and Kristen Milotti, and it's got some dinosaurs in it. And Garrett and I watched it. There are two scenes with dinosaurs. These are potential spoilers if you want to watch the movie first and come back and listen to this. Not really, though. <laughs> well, yeah, it doesn't really have anything to do with the story, but... <laughs> In one of the scenes, the characters are in the desert and they see some dinosaurs and it's unclear if they hallucinate them or if the dinosaurs are real and there's some weird time loop stuff happening. And they're near, one of the explanations is that the characters are near the dinosaurs that are featured in Pee-wee's Big Adventure. <laughs> so maybe they saw those sculptures before and that's why they could have hallucinated them. Interesting. I'm surprised you just called them dinosaurs because they were definitely sauropods. That's true. They were <laughs> sauropods. <laughs> but they're like weirdly in the distance and it has nothing to do with the plot of the movie. You so can, it's pretty weird. You can barely see them. It's a pretty good movie though. I liked it. So the writer of the movie, Andy Ciara, <laughs> made some comments about this because a lot of people were talking about it. And he wrote, I could say that you have two characters who don't believe they're capable of love, and in that moment, maybe they fall in love. Dinosaurs don't exist, but in that moment, they exist. It's two things that are impossible. Or, I can also just say that I love Jurassic Park and I wanted to put that in there. It <laughs> felt right in that moment. How do we make this scene stand out more? What better way than to add dinosaurs? <laughs> <laughs> we could see more dinosaurs just being added into scenes that make no sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good choice. It was a fun movie, but yeah, can't explain the dinosaurs. No. And don't watch it thinking you're going to see some dinosaurs because you barely do. Yeah. Yeah, it's not for the dinosaurs. In Jurassic World Dominion news, Sam Neill, who's returning as Dr. Alan Grant, has said that there will be screaming. He <laughs> said in a recent interview, quote, I can't give anything away, but a real life dinosaur is a compelling thing to someone who's devoted his life to them. There will be screaming. We know this, end quote. 
I was a little confused by that because the reason Dr. Alan Grant went to Jurassic Park in the first place was because he was someone who has devoted his life to dinosaurs. But I guess it sucks him back in because of that. Hmm. <laughs> or he has no choice because the dinosaurs are everywhere. That's true. Oh, and so Dr. Grant, Ellie Sattler, and Ian Malcolm will have large, not cameo roles in the movie. Ooh. The most important one there is Jeff Goldblum. Yes, Ian Malcolm. You need more Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> Maybe they'll reenact the, their meme. <laughs> Get him shirtless and wounded. Yeah. <laughs> in game news, there's a trailer for a new game called Death Ground, where you need to outsmart dinosaurs, and you can play this game solo or co-op. It's a survival horror game with AI dinosaurs, so it sounds a lot like Jurassic Park, but with AI to me. The game is set to go out early access in 2021, and it'll be fully released in 2022. It's got a ways to go. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And last, for people who like dinosaurs and baking, The Guardian shared a Spanish burnt basque cheesecake recipe decorated with dinosaur cookies. Though the recipe says you can also use dinosaur figurines, but why would you do that if you're going to decorate with dinosaurs anyway? So for the dinosaur cookies or biscuits part, it recommends making ginger biscuits and shape them with dinosaur cookie cutters. So there's not actually a lot of info on the dinosaur part, but it still sounded delicious. And the picture is really pretty. Nice. They make it look volcanic. And then the dinosaurs are sitting precariously on top. People love mixing volcanoes and dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. I think it's because of the old extinction theories. But it makes about as much sense as putting a bunch of humans around a volcano. <laughs> it's cheesecake and cookies, so. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's harder to make a cake look like a crater or an impactor coming down. Yes. Maybe you could have it like a mid-impact, have like a big bulbous bump and put some dents in it and make it like the impactor hitting. You could have a cake smashing party where the dinosaurs <laughs> are on top of the cake and then you just smash it with your hand <laughs> and that's the crater. I was expecting you to say smash it into my face. <laughs> <laughs> I know you like to do that. Well. When he let me, which was only at our wedding. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and now onto our dinosaur of the day, Cryptosaurus, which was a request from Tarkia Tamer via our Discord and Patreon. So thanks. Cryptosaurus was an ankylosaur that lived in the late Jurassic and what is now England in the Ant Hill Clay Formation in Cambridgeshire. It's a dubious genus because it's only known from a partial femur. This femur, though, it's really thick and stout. It's about... 13 inches or 33 centimeters long, and the femur belonged to either a subadult or an adult. Cryptosaurus was herbivorous, and the type and only species is Cryptosaurus umeris. The genus name means hidden lizard, and it refers to it being a rare find because it was the first one found in the Oxford clay formation, even though later it was determined to be from Amptail clay formation, but that's a story we'll get into in a minute. The species name means well-formed thigh in Greek. So they found a partial right femur in 1869, early days of finding dinosaur bones. It was found by geologist Lucas Eubank, who donated it to the Woodwardian Museum at Cambridge. Harry Seeley then named Cryptosaurus in 1869, and Seeley's description was very brief. I'll read the whole thing. It was, quote, on a shelf G is temporarily placed the femur of a dinosaur from the Oxford clay, Cryptosaurus humerus, end quote. That's quite the description. So useful. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> this is before we had standards for these things. Well, he did give a full description in 1875, so it took him six years. <laughs> Seeley thought that Cryptosaurus was an animal, quote, of sluggish habits and that it may have been cold-blooded. We used to think that dinosaurs were cold-blooded. He also thought that Cryptosaurus was related to Iguanodon. Again, not many dinosaurs found at this point. And then later in 1909, Frederick von Huyn classified Cryptosaurus as Camptosauridae. And then in 1980, Peter Galton found Cryptosaurus to be an ankylosaur. Huh, twist. Yep. So I got to quickly go over the name Cryptosaurus. Richard Lidecker renamed Cryptosaurus in 1889 to Cryptodraco because he thought that Cryptosaurus was already used to name a crocodiliform in 1832. And by the scientific rules, the first name has to be the one that stays. But it turns out that this was an error. And due to the wrong spelling, the crocodiliform was actually Cystosaurus instead of Cryptosaurus. So the name Cryptosaurus was actually free to name the dinosaur after. 
For some reason, Lidecker said that it was unknown where this femur was found, even though Seeley described the locality, the Oxford clay, in his one sentence description. <laughs> but anyway, Galton found the femur of Cryptosaurus, although at the time it was still being called Cryptodraco, very similar to the femur of Hoplitosaurus. And he wrote that the name Cryptodraco slash Cryptosaurus, because that both names were used in his paper, quote, has turned out to be extremely appropriate because it took over 110 years for the ankylosaurian affinities of this femur to be recognized, end quote. <laughs> like we don't know what it's called. We also don't know what it's from. <laughs> yep. Well, Galton figured it out, ankylosaur. So Galton wrote that the femur was found with 17 associated pliosaurus vertebrae, and therefore the femur, quote, must have come from a brick pit rather than as an isolated bone from a conglomerate. And that's how they determined that cryptosaurs actually came from the Amp Hill Claim Formation and not the Oxford Clay. Is that what made it a dubious genus that we don't know where it came from? No, we're pretty sure it's the Amp Hill Clay Formation now. I don't know what Seeley was doing, but it's dubious because it's only known from a partial femur. Oh, so it's just not enough because we have lots of other ankylosaurs that it could be? Yes. So Galton suggested that the ancestors of cryptosaurus were probably bipedal ornithopods, but that cryptosaurs may have been facultatively bipedal. So normally it walked at all fours, but then it could go on two legs when necessary. It's pretty weird for an ankylosaur. There's a lot of weird things about this dinosaur. <laughs> Need more fossils. Yeah. Or just for, to forget about it, because it's not a good enough to find to be particularly useful. Wow, well, you want to forget about an ankylosaur. But it might not even be an ankylosaur, let's be real. A <laughs> partial femur. <laughs> But speaking of ankylosaurs, our fun fact comes from our earlier Borealopelta paper. In it, they mentioned that for about 140 million years, essentially at least all of the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, every single terrestrial mega herbivore on Earth was a dinosaur. Wow. So completely dominated by dinosaurs. The opposite of today. Yes. And apparently for the last 40 million years, mammals have been the dominant terrestrial mega herbivores maybe just mega herbivores in general but i'm always a little bit suspicious that there's something in the ocean that i'm not including <laughs> that counts as a mega herbivore that might not be a mammal within dinosauria though mega herbivores evolved at least five times so there's sauropodomorpha which evolved in the triassic we were talking about that earlier there's thyreophora which is the stegosaur slash ankylosaur group that evolved in the Triassic or Jurassic, and I guess maybe more than once. There's Iguanodontia, which evolved in the Jurassic. There's Ceratopsida, which evolved in the Cretaceous. Of course, things like Triceratops. Therizinosauria, <laughs> the weirdest of all, which evolved in the Cretaceous from meat-eating dinosaurs into a mega herbivore. Of course. Basically, mega mega carnivore into mega herbivore. <laughs> Typical transition, just like you'd expect from Therizinosaurus. So that's the five that they included. But it, I thought maybe they would include Hadrosauridae. I'm thinking maybe they didn't because I guess it could have shared a mega herbivore ancestor with Iguanodontia. Maybe is where they're going with that. It seems like there's at least six, though. It's a lot of mega herbivores going on in Dinosauria. I guess they had a lot of plants to eat. And in some cases, also a lot of gastrolis to swallow. <laughs> yeah. And wood. And charcoal. Whatever they could fit into their mouths. Yeah. Sometimes crustaceans. And on that note, that wraps up this episode of Vino Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app. And consider joining our community at patreon.com slash Thanks again. And until next time. Good day, boom.